the Strategic Hot Box with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Discussing leadership, business, and how to take control of your life and achieve greatness. From the streets of Las Vegas, energized, informed, and never diluted. It's time to kick some ass. Welcome to the Strategic Hot Box. My name is Dr. Brandy Stankovic, or just be love or anything else of those people out there that know me. And I feel like you should probably know me by now because of the fact that it's our 10th episode. Can you believe it? So thank you to all of you pioneers that have been with us from the very beginning. Today, we're going to talk about travel and we have a very special guest here with us. So let's go ahead and dig right in. Before I bring our special guest, Doug Chambers here to join us. Thank you for being here. Thanks Doug. for having me. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about what, what, what do I mean by travel and why would it be important to leadership? Why would we have a specific episode on becoming more of a jet set? or a cultured jet setter. And really, I'm going to break it down into their three segments, just like we always do. First is the learn segment. We'll have that leadership challenge today, talking about travel, urging people to travel, even if it's playing tourist in your own city or seeing the small corners of your state, or even more importantly, getting out and seeing the world. We're going to talk through all of those pieces. Next, we're going to go into our love section, and we have the opportunity to speak with Doug and other subject matter experts during this segment. And finally, we'll have our kick-ass segment. And that is all about the execution. How are we going to go out there and make a difference and do something differently today? So when it comes to travel, um, I've been asked to give advice to young leaders. I've been asked to give advice to, to young at heart or older leaders. And really, it's just about the more that you can get out there and travel, the better. Sometimes people ask me how I even survive. So for the work and things that I do, I get to travel all over the United States, even the globe um, from time to time. And I'm gone potentially average three days a week. And so I'm on the road. I'm a road warrior. So cheers to all of my road warriors, fellow road warriors out there listening and watching us today. Uh, but really, I think that travel does three things. The first is it creates tolerance, and I'll dig into that. Second, perseverance. And third, it's like this broadened awareness and being more focused. So it's tolerance, perseverance, and awareness. So if I dig into tolerance, what I mean by that is being more tolerant of other cultures. I recently, this year, was in um, Belfast in Northern Ireland and, and spent some time in the UK as well. And just, you know, kind of being able to see what different cultures are going through. And it was right after the break away from um, the U European Union and just kind of what's happening politically. It, it just, it, their, their perspective on what's happening with our political elections here. Um, it's just an interesting kind of way to broaden. Another example of that is I spent some time in Ecuador in 2007 uh, with the World Council. And we went down and we visited a, a credit union or the equivalent of what we would call a credit union here in the United States. And it uh, that institution was growing in the aftermath of that massive uh, environmental disaster. There was the, the mudslides and everything that happened around 1993. And one of the cool things that was happening at this particular financial institution that we went to visit is that they were already text banking in 2007. Now, that seems kind of like, mm, you know, no big deal because we do so much text banking now. But back then, we didn't do any. And we actually had regulators that were with me in this trip and in this kind of visit to this institution. They're like, mm -mm, no, no way. And even the technology people were like, no way. Multi-factor authentication. We can't do it. No way. And here's this country that in some different rural villages could be considered um, you know, third world or whatever, just in the fact that they're they're beginning to prosper more and more, rebuilding after disaster. Here they're doing something even more innovative and forward than, than we are in the United States. So it was an opportunity for me to kind of go, whoa, maybe there's a whole lot more that's possible. Another example for you in regards to tolerance is I visited China uh, in, I think it was 2008, 2008 or 2009, and we were there and we actually did all this little side visit uh, and went and saw the terracotta warriors, right? And that m m amazing. If anybody has ever been to China or has a, an opportunity to go in the future, please go visit this. It's just it, it'll take your breath away. But in the process of this, I had my old like razor phone because again, it was a pretty long time ago and I took a picture of these terracotta warriors and tried to send it to my dad. And in that process, um, my phone was completely shut down. And I'm just like, I thought at first it was broken. Well, it turns out that, that because I was texting a photo of a historic place and the words and things that I put in it, that, that China just decided, nope, 
that the government just has that much control over the internet and over the the cell kind of towers and that type of thing that they just said, nope, you're, you're done texting for your trip here in China. And then my phone worked when I got back to the U.S. And so I, we dug into that because I was there with some doctoral students and a bunch of people smarter than me. And we, we talked about the fact that we learned that 2 million people are employed in China just to sweep the internet. And so little things like that, these just little nuggets that I've learned both in Ecuador, in fact, that being forward in innovation or China in the fact that there, there's more control. It just really is about broadening. And when you go to different places, you can see what it actually, what poverty actually looks like in different countries. You can see what maybe wealth or wealth of love and family actually looks like. I mean, all of those different things, when you go to different places, you get this higher tolerance of of of. Maybe you, you're happy to be home when you get home, or you're just happy to be learning about other cultures and other places. So the second piece is the perseverance. I talked to you a little bit about perseverance, but really you get brutalized when you're out on the road. So even if you're a road warrior and traveling for the things that you do in the United States um, or in, in whatever country that you that you live, but also if you if you travel outside, you just, I mean, stuff, shit happens, right? Like you are bound to fall on the ground and you're bound to lose your bag. The things are just going to happen when you're out there. Uh, for example, I went to Italy in 2005 uh, for business, and I packed this beautiful bag that never made it to Italy, and I actually never saw the bag again, uh, but I was in Italy for like 10 days, and I got there and learned from that point forward, I have never worn something on an airplane that I can't wear for the next 10 days, right? So I'm not a sweats-wearing <laughs> kind of human being anyway. But I, when I got to Italy, I was going around trying to find clothing and stuff. And I'm, I'm, I'm American sized, right? I mean, I'm five foot nine. Like I'm just the size of an American and Americans are different sizes than people in other places in this world. And specifically in, in Italy when I was there. So I couldn't even find some of the things that I wanted to do for our business meeting. So of course, it, you know, survival mode, we made it, but it was just this massive learning experience. And you get this kind of brutalized thing that you just have to get over it. My business meetings have to go on. I have to be just as effective in my keynotes or my presentations or my energizing than I was if I had clean clothes and some, and some deodorant. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the final, the final one is awareness. Before we bring in our guest speaker here and our, uh, our, you know, our enthusiast and our expert, uh, the third one is awareness, and really it's that concept of look alive. Maybe remember when I shared about with my kids, I could tell them to look alive. Or if you're in the the field playing a sport, just look alive, be aware of what's happening. Because no matter where I've been in the world, there's always been um, places where bags are slashed, or wallets are stolen, or cameras, you know, pulled off necks, and all c kinds of things like that from tourists that weren't paying attention and that weren't aware of their surroundings and where they were at. But it's also important to just look up and look around once in a while and take in the places that you are to fit in. I always feel like my efforts in different countries is I love to fit in. Now, there are some countries like China or different populations where I just don't physically fit in, right? But there are others where um, we were in the Czech Republic a few years back and by the third day, somebody was speaking to us in their language thinking that we were, you know, that we were part of the country. And I love that. I want to look like a local. I want to fit in and feel and feel the culture because real culture is felt um, in that way. The final story I want to share with you is, um, is this idea of awareness and being able to, to, to kind of be, be in it and be around, surrounded in it. So I was in the Netherlands in Amsterdam and it was one of the first times, it was the second time I'd ever been before. And it was like 2002. So it was a very long time ago and I was a baby and I did what all respectable 20 somethings do when they go to Amsterdam. Right. You know, like dot, dot, dot. I mean, this is, yeah, this is the hot box after all. Um, <laughs> no, uh, but anyway, so we, of course, go and we uh, partake in some things that were legal in Amsterdam. And now here we are, you know, fast forward 15 years later, and it's happening all over the U.S. as well. But in Amsterdam, it was pretty different. And so we go through some, all we had to do was catch our bus at the very end of the evening to, we were staying in Monacan Dam. And that seems relatively easy, right? Catch the 1 a.m. bus to Monaco Dam. Well, all changes when you, when I uh, speak from the eye, partake in, you know, my 20s and something that's happening in Amsterdam. And because of that, now we're, we're rushing. This is my brother and I. We're rushing to try to find this bus. And we're amongst this group of people. And I even, like, fell down as we were running because I was in shoes I shouldn't have been wearing. Another, you know, lesson learned from the road. But anyway, I fall down so my, my knees are, are bleeding. And we get on this bus. And one of our friends uh, starts kind of swaying like this in the bus in front of us, right? And so if you can't see me, I'm just kind of swaying back and forth as if I'm dizzy or something to that effect. And then next thing you know, he turns and just 
<laughs> it pukes all over the aisle of the bus. And so we're on a public transport, right? The bus driver pulls over and says, get out. Seriously, every single one of us had to get out. And we had no idea where we were between Amsterdam and Monacan Dam. And mind you, again, we caught the 1 a.m. bus, right? And so here we are in the middle of the night. He closed the door and drives off. And so we just start walking in the direction that the bus was going. But we we're so concerned about our friend that was sick that we didn't see him make a left turn. And so we kept going down this road. An hour later, somebody pulls over in a truck and said, where are you guys going? And, you know, and then kind of pointed us in the right direction. And we finally made it back to the, the room. But not only is it a silly story and funny story now, considering, you know, the fact that we were in Amsterdam getting lost after, you know, partaking too much or whatever. But the flip side of that is also what came from that is just being a bit more aware, being a bit more on your game when it comes to getting home, being safe. There's so many things that could have happened that didn't happen. Happen and that we're very blessed and lucky to have made it back to our hotel because, you know, travel does that. We're not in the culture that we know. And even so, we should, you know, keep keep your focus, keep alive, keep keep your head on straight. So with that, I want to hear about some stories of one of my cohorts here. His name is uh, Doug Chambers. He's been to several continents and uh, many, many countries and even 49 of the states, which is incredible. Uh, did his mission in Taiwan, which we'll, I hopefully we'll learn more about. But one of the coolest things here is the every year he rides his motorcycle for 10 days, either on his own or with one other cohort. And so I find what I with one of the main reasons that we have him here and he's excited to, to learn from him. is very thirsty. He has this cultured view on leadership, learning, and travel. So please join me in welcoming Doug. Thank Hi, you, Doug. Brandy. How Hi. are you? Good. How are you doing? So tell us a little bit about your kind of why is travel important to you? Well, I, I think that you told some really cool stories that for me, uh, you know, tell the tale of what travel does to a person. And, you know, you talked about yeah, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes. You know, you talked about the poverty that you see, sort of like having things go wrong. And you just have to sort of deal with it. Mm -hmm. I think for me, travel brings out the humanity in me. And, and mm -hmm. I think I think that you can't really get very far, you know, as a leader without having some humanity. And so for me, when you're I talking think. about, uh, you know, all, all your shit is lost on the on the airplane and you have to sort of like just deal with it for a few days. I mean, that, that's happened to most people who who travel. Right. And I think that you it, it just makes you more patient. It, yes. it makes you a person who just mm -hmm. realizes that things are going to go wrong. Mm -hmm. And if I'm, if we're already starting to like make, uh, you know, connections with leadership, mm -hmm. I think some of the best things a leader can do is just underreact in, mm -hmm. in certain situations. Mm -hmm. And I think travel helps you learn how to do that because you've been through it. You've been through it. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. It kind of is like emerging in a, a culture, right? From a language perspective, is always a good idea. But doing that kind of immerses you into dealing with shit that comes up yeah and, and i have to i do have to tell you that uh Please. you said that you were in maybe the czech republic uh -huh. and you people were fit starting in. to think mm -hmm. that you yeah you fit in people thought that maybe you were czech uh-huh that's never happened to me so never I, in any country you've ever never been? Uh, any country so when i when i'm in mexico <laughs> when i'm in china when i'm in taiwan when i'm in italy i look very american i, yeah. I can't help myself and I talk very, I speak it's very. It's the Lakers yeah. jersey you wear when you go. I do, I do, I do wear a Lakers jersey. I, I have a huge gold chain that I wear <laughs> everywhere. It's the yeah. saggy pants. I mean, I can't on. help myself. And I will not <laughs> stop wearing saggy pants just to fit in in some other culture. Um, so then what is your advice? What's, what are some, you know, advice that you have for people that are beginning their travel or want to look forward to travel? Uh, first of all, just go do the thing. So last summer I was sitting at my desk uh, on a Wednesday and I thought, boy, I, I've never been to Italy. Mm. And so Saturday I was on a plane, that same Saturday I was on a plane to Italy. Wow. So I think that a lot of times we come up with a lot of reasons to not, not travel. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? We, we come up with, well, we have this and I have these responsibilities and time off and I want to make sure I've got the money for it. Well, th those are reasons to, I, I, they're good reasons, I guess. Right. But my advice would be just go, just, just go. travel. Yeah. yeah. And you can travel for cheap. I, I mean, a lot of times people think that they have to travel in style. They have to travel in class. Right. They don't. They, you don't. Uh -huh. You really don't. And you get a better experience that way too, I think. I agree. Yeah. And I think that you said that they just go in that these excuses that we come up with, the stories that we tell ourselves, in a lot of cases, they're very valid stories. Mm -hmm. It's not whether or not they're valid. It's more just what's a priority, yeah. whining about it or making it happen, right? Yeah. I, I think they might be valid, but I think they are... I think that if you just rearrange your priorities and realize that, hey, this is something that I want to do, this mm -hmm. is somewhere that I want to go. Uh, and maybe be willing a, to go alone. 
right? Yeah, yeah. That, and that's that's hard for a lot of people. But yeah. if you have like I have children, so if I really wanted to travel somewhere, I could go. My husband could be with babies, or vice versa, yeah. right? He could go off, and I could be with the babies if we couldn't, in fact, do it. Yeah, I like. I think them. traveling alone is sort of the best way to travel. I, I say this. I'm married. I have children. I have mm-hmm. friends. But I do think traveling you have alone. Friends too. I do have wow, friends. That's yeah, good. it's shocking to most people that meet me for a few minutes. But yeah, I do have some friends. But I think traveling alone uh, not only teaches you about other cultures, but it teaches you something about yourself. Yeah. You know, I think that you you kind of learn what makes you tick, what things that you want to do when mm-hmm. no one has an opinion as to what you're going to go do. Right. But I, yeah. what, so what's something that you've learned about yourself in your travels? Well, I, I've... I, so last year in Italy, mm-hmm. um, I left my iPad on the train. So I took the I took the train from Venice to Rome mm-hmm. and I got to my little Airbnb and unpacked. And in the process of unpacking, I realized I had left my iPad on the... On the train. Yeah, uh-huh. on the train. So I, I am, I'm, I'm a big guy. I, I ran through the streets of Rome back to the train station and I started to explain to one of the security officer people that right. was there, oh, I think I left my iPad on the train. He's like, it's gone. It's not going to be there. And so I, I, I didn't believe him. So I hopped over the little uh, turnstile thing <laughs> and just booked it. So this guy's now chasing me through the train station of Rome and I booked it back onto the train. And sure enough, it was I there? found my iPad. Wow. But, I, but, I think, but I think about if I had done that in the States, mm-hmm. I, I mean, I you guess you shot. learn. Yeah, you would get shot. <laughs> you would get shot, I think. And so I think that you learn a little bit about not only yourself, but uh, it kind of makes you understanding of other cultures mm-hmm. that that's kind of okay to do that. That's right. okay to just book it. You know what I mean? Or to push. I think the one thing that I hear and learn from yeah. that is that you just, it was important enough to you to just, to make it a passionate thing that you were risking whatever came from that. Cause you could have gotten in more trouble or whatever. Yes, I didn't get any trouble. In fact, he cheered with me while I, when I, I can, I sort it. of held my iPad up over my like head as a, champion. As a, as a yeah. trophy. Yeah. Nice. And he cheered for me. So <laughs> well, that's good. he didn't understand. We didn't speak the same language anyway. So it's a I think that that goes a long way too. It's good to not speak a language. You learn about your communication style a little bit mm, when you don't speak the same language. Yeah. When you go different places, speaking of language, when you go different places, do you try to learn a little bit as you go? I, I try. I'm not very good at languages, and mm-hmm. so I do try. I speak uh, Mandarin uh, mm-hmm. poorly. Mm-hmm. I speak uh, English poorly, but I, <laughs> I but I try to learn some language as I'm there. Sure, right. I'm the same. But it's kind of hard too because you know you've been in the situation where someone is speaking your language and they can't, and you mm-hmm. can't understand them. There's that growing frustration. So mm-hmm. I think people appreciate the effort, but definitely a lot of times it, it kind of it's hard falls short. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's that's a, a good point, and. and appreciating that people are trying at least and the hard part is in the united states a lot of people um speak english obviously here in the u.s but abroad as well Mm -hmm. and so we get a little lazy in language and that's not really fair either we should you know put forth the effort yeah there's some ethnocentricity that i mean we Mm -hmm. we we expect everyone here to speak our language so if you're going to come to america you got to speak our language well that's tough if you've been in another country right and rely on people to be able to communicate with you yeah (laughs) that don't have if you're going to come to our country you better speak English. And by the way, if I go to your country, you also had Have better speak <laughs> English. I, I think that's total double standard. I yeah. think there's some arrogance mm-hmm. there. And, and so that, I think that helps. Uh, I, I, I guess I keep trying to bring this back to leadership, but I, I think that helps uh-huh, Please learn how to communicate with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it helps you sort of have some empathy for, you know, people are doing their best. They're not right. doing your best sometimes. Mm-hmm. And, and you have to cheer on their best, you know, love that. Love that. So what's the furthest places that you've traveled? Uh, I guess China, uh, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I I served an LDS mission. I'm not very good about being LDS anymore, but I did serve an LDS mission Mm -hmm. uh, in Taiwan. And so I was there for two years. That's halfway across the country. And that's where you learned your Mandarin? That's where I learned to speak Mandarin. Excellent. Yeah. And so what's something that you picked up from there that you still utilize today? Uh, You know, you had mentioned that you just have to have some Mm -hmm. self-actualization. I'm 6'5", I weigh more pounds than I want to (laughs) weigh. And when I went into a shop looking for pants, and I always, I used to love going shopping for pants and shoes in Taiwan Mm -hmm. because the, the, person in the shop would just kind of look at me Gasp. and go yeah and just like okay well here we go you know and they get out like a sewing like literally get out like a sewing machine and try to hodge like throw together a pair a of pants pairs. for me yeah and so I wore I wore uh, misshapen pants for about 18 months of my life with like one leg longer than the other and my socks sticking out yeah. but they were custom I they were custom I told them I was the Michael Jackson of Taiwan so I wore white socks and I had oh, I sort see. of my pant yeah. legs really mm-hmm. high yeah nice 
Not in any weird way. Like just in the pants department, the Michael. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what's an experience or a disaster that you've survived that, that you still think about today? Man, a disaster. I mean, the, the biggest disasters that I've, I've been through is being out of gas, no money, no way to communicate. You know, I, I talked about going to foreign countries. Mm-hmm. I've had my motorcycle in Texas. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, that, that's a there's a foreign language spoken in Texas too. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, and so <laughs> and so I thought that I had more gas than I did, and you know Texas is not a good place to break down in the middle of. I, I try to avoid like freeways and stuff like that, so mm-hmm. like sort of on a back road, mm-hmm. and I just started walking, you know, and finally, you know, people would drive past me and they wouldn't they wouldn't stop. Finally, somebody stopped. And sort of, I explain my predicament to them. And I mean, people are awesome everywhere. And that's the yeah. thing that you learn is that the people are just amazing. And, uh, you know, Willing we might help. interpret things differently, but this guy, so this guy like drove me to a gas station, nice, bought me a gas can filled with gas, drove me back to my motorcycle. I mean, this guy's taking an hour out of his day wow. uh, to do this. And, you know, I kept trying to say, hey, let me, you know, I'll, let me go into town. I can get some money, you know, whatever. Right. And just refused, you know, he just refused. And so, you know, that's a predicament, but again, you know, shit happens. And Mm -hmm. if you just kind of roll with it, Mm -hmm. you get to have some pretty cool experiences. I mean, for me, every time something goes wrong, something even better, something better comes along. Something goes even more right. And he definitely has some karma points for something like that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, definitely. So it sounds like our first ever, this is that you're losing your virginity with us here in the podcast. And what I mean by that is we have a question from somebody that's, that's listening or watching us today. So, uh, you know, let us know Zach. or we have a question from Zach. Yeah. Zach wants to know, he's got to know Doug's favorite international visited city and his favorite U S state. Ooh, I like that question. My, my favorite international city. Mm-hmm. God, Rome was pretty amazing. Yeah. Um, I think Venice might be one of mine for yeah, sure. Yeah, Venice, Venice, London, Amsterdam. London is, is yeah, really Rome. awesome. Yeah. Um, my favorite U.S. state. I'm from Idaho, so I'm pretty particular to Idaho because there's a lot of uh, just beautiful places, beautiful there. undiscovered. Mm-hmm. I think Utah is actually my favorite state, and I and, and the reason Utah's I say that too. is because I've been pretty much on every strip of road in Utah on my motorcycle. Mm -hmm. And Utah, you go, you know, North Utah, there's the Wasatch Mountains Mm -hmm. and you're just up 5,000 feet and it's amazing. And then you go into Southern Utah and you have Zions National Park, Bryce Canyon, uh, you know, arches over by Moab. And so I think Utah is probably my favorite state uh, with, with, uh, you know, respect to Hawaii, I guess. Yeah. Hawaii, yeah. I mean, mine for sure is Nevada. Mainly well, why not? I yeah. Here. Yeah. yeah. Nevada exactly. is great. Nevada is great. What a great question. So thank you. That was exciting to yes, have a question. Yes, I feel All good right. about they, popping my that. cherry on the... Yeah, <laughs> exactly. exactly. To help us do that in that process. All right. Final question for you. Give us a, a takeaway or an action step for leaders that are thinking about travel. Okay. Uh, go. <laughs> I, I know. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I, love I, th- it. I think go. Um, we take for granted uh, how cool... The world is when I, when I was in Rome last year, I made friends with this guy who owned a cafe just outside of um, the Colosseum, mm-hmm. and so he and I would kind of hang out. and And I went there one morning and and was sort of helping him get his stuff put together. and uh, This guy is in the shadow of the Colosseum, so millions of people come to this Amazing. Colosseum uh-huh. uh, every day, you know, and year. It's been here hundreds and hundreds of years, and, and for him, it's just like oh that thing building uh-huh you know we, we we take for granted the things that are most amazing you, you know um uh can i quote emerson i mean sure, em- 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 emerson said something along the lines of you know true wisdom is basically finding the miraculous in the ordinary mm-hmm. well a lot of times we make ordinary the miraculous so even worse mm-hmm. right so i i think that uh appreciating what there is to see, mm-hmm. appreciating what's around you. You know, you said a really good thing, which is start by traveling in your own hometown. Mm-hmm. Start by taking a different route. Start by walking to work. And I know, I mean, five miles, why would we? No, do it. You know, do just it. just mm-hmm. do cool things that will give you a new perspective and that will translate into leadership for sure. Love it. Thank you for being Thanks for here, having Doug. Me. I Thank appreciate you. the time and your sharing of your wisdom. So let's go out now and see our international shout out. Hi, welcome to Splash, Aberfeldy, Central Perth, Scotland. We 
We are Chris, Thomas, Mark, Jacobo, Ivan, and you're listening to Brandy on the Strategy in the Hot Box. Yeah! <laughs> Thank you to the gentleman from Splash Whitewater in Scotland. I love those accents. I can't say it enough. <laughs> thank you so much for sending us a shout out. And thank you again uh, to Doug for sharing your wisdom with us. So now it's time to kick some ass. So our top five, it's really funny that, that Doug said it in the way that he did. And yeah, he'll appreciate my number one. But the number one piece of advice that I have for people, our number one kick ass strategy today is... Go. Simply go. Get out there and go. So we're exactly on the same page in that regard. That doesn't always say yes. Make it happen. Get out there. Travel as much as possible. Again, even if it is in your own city or getting to know or walking to work. I love that idea. Number two is to open your eyes. When you are in that process, be aware. We were chatting about cell phones and the addictiveness of cell phones and social media and all these things. And it causes us to just, you know, hunch over in a small little ball and, and spend time looking at one little screen as opposed to the amazingness that is around us and breathing the air and breathing the sunshine. Number three is there's no whining, right? So the people that I'm speaking to in Italy don't care if this is the outfit that I wore yesterday. You know, the people that I'm working with in different places don't care. It's, it's about getting the results that they need in the situations that they have. And so really traveling is about just not whining. I always carry on my bag now, by the way. I think that's partly from those deep rooted things <laughs> that happen in Italy. But it really, you just, there's no, there's no place for that. You have to build up that perseverance and that tolerance. Number four is, I didn't really mention it too specifically, but keep a journal. I've been keeping a journal for a very long time, and I think it's a great place to capture some of those moments, those aha things, those self-discoveries, as, as Doug was kind of mentioning. And it also is an opportunity to bring culture back. Anytime that I go spend a little bit more significant time in a country, I try to bring something back. So whether it's a recipe of food um, by asking locals or finding something that's more local style and menus and different things, or it's a way to do something or a little tidbit of knowledge or a new song or piece of culture or flavor and things that I see in different places because it allows me to then broaden my family and the people that I'm with um, mind as well and that kind of takes me to a number five and that's sharing the discoveries back in the day that me meant putting like little slideshows and grandma and grandpa like clicking the button I mean, at least I've seen that on movies, right? I've been watching the slideshows after, after traveling. But nonetheless, I mean, you want to be able to share. And that's more than just utilizing your Facebook page or your Instagram when you are out there. It's about just sharing the things that you've learned and learned about other people, learned about the world, and then learned, of course, about yourself. So that's our top five kick-ass strategies. So thank you again to Doug Chambers for being here with us. We'd love to hear any topics that you would like to learn or challenges that you're faced in your, in your leadership journey. And we'll tackle them here at the Strategic Hot Box. So share your thoughts with us on Twitter or Instagram. That's at Brandy Love, B-R-A-N-D-I-L-U-V. Or email us at podcast at strategichotbox.com. And then, of course, be sure to add this show to your favorite RSS feed. We'd love to have you. So until next time, go kick some ass.